This meeting is now being recorded. I'm going to turn on my webcam as well. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional Full Salish lands includes the Salish Tooth, the, Squ uh, the Squamish, Musqueam Nation. This series is brought to you by Farm to School BC, a healthy eating program administered by the Public Health Association of BC and supported by the province of British Columbia and the Provincial Health Services Authority. We would also like to thank our partners specific to this webinar, including Farm to Cafeteria Canada, Simon Fraser University, and Food Systems Lab at SFU. My name is Richard and I will be your moderator today. Farm to School BC was established in 2007 and it is a diverse and expanding provincial network that promotes and supports things, farm to school activities and programs across the province. Farm to School brings healthy local and sustainable food into schools and provides students with hands-on learning opportunities that develop food literacy all while strengthening the local food systems and enhancing school and community connectedness. And this is October, which is Farm to School Month. And being Farm to School Month, this is a month where we really want to acknowledge all the hard work and hands that go into making Farm to School programs possible all across the province. We want to hear from you about your Farm to School programs. Um, so you can tag us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter and share your stories with the hashtag F2SBC. Thank you everyone for joining. I see that we have 21 guests on the line today and I imagine that we may have another few more that will trickle in as the time goes on. This is the first of the many webinar series that we will hope to host uh, throughout this school year. Coinciding with the regional hubs that we support across the province, uh, we will be hosting webinars to reach the broader audiences and I hope that this can be a platform where we highlight stories from each of the farm to school regions in BC and bring you stories of inspiration and strength from teachers, dietitians, farmers, parents, students, and beyond. Our next webinar will be in November from the capital region. So please stay tuned up uh, for that. And you can find out more information by signing up to our newsletter and our listserv. And once we have the final details, we'll be sure to let you know about that as well. And for those of you that want to learn more about food systems after this webinar, we are hosting a conference, the Public Health Association of BC, in Vancouver between November 14th to 15th around public health approaches and practices in complex systems, including more information about Farm to School BC and a food systems plenary session with speakers including uh, Tamara, Dr. Tamara Soma, the presenter today, but also includes other notable members including Minister Hopham from Ministry of Agriculture, Melanie Karine, the Provincial Manager of Food Security from uh, PHSA, Laura Schneider, an Indigenous herbalist and educator, and also myself. For more information about the conference, please visit phbc.org, or you can contact me for more information. Finally, before I begin, some housekeeping items. Uh, this is a um, online platform that PHABC is using. This will be recorded and made available afterwards on our website. The slides will also be made available. Um, depending on the time, we may have some uh, time at the end of the the presentation for some questions, but given that Dr. Soma is having to leave at four o'clock sharp, um, there will be contact information that will be made available to all of you here if you wanted to follow up with Dr. Soma after this presentation. So without further ado, I would like to invite our guest speaker, Dr. Tamara Soma. Dr. Tamara Soma is an assistant professor at the School of Resource and Environmental Management and the research director of the Food Systems Lab at Simon Fraser University. She's committee member of the U.S. National Acad Academies of Science on a Systems Approach to Reduce Consumer Food Waste, and her work has been featured on mainstream media such as uh, Chatelaine Magazine, The Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, just to name a few. She has published on the topic of food systems planning and food waste in numerous academic journals, including International Journal Planning Studies, Built Environment, Local Environment, and much more. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Marasoma. Thank you so much, Richard, and I hope um, everyone can hear me. Um, so happy to happy um, Farm to School Month, and also happy Stop Food Waste Day, which is um, today is actually Stop Food Waste Day. Um, my presentation today is called Influencing the Influencers, 
how to make food waste reduction go viral. And uh, I guess one of the thing with the webinar format is that I can't really hear you because you've been muted. But one thing is that when I go through my presentation and if I ask a question, um, even if I can't hear you, feel free to um, put your answer in the chat because then I can see that you're actually participating and it will just make me so happy. So um, again, uh, in terms of the presentation, yes, uh, I'm going to show a picture of myself again, um, just to explain a little bit about the Food Systems Lab. So the Food Systems Lab is a collaborative research hub um, that brings together diverse stakeholders across the food system to understand the root causes of food waste and work on effective systematic and just social outcomes. And the Food Systems Lab is based at SFU. What's really exciting about what we do at the Food Systems Lab is we get to do a lot of fun projects and research. We do a lot of youth engagement, food literacy project. We measure garbage and waste. Uh, we contribute to Canada's food policy. And if you know anyone, any student, um, anybody that is interested in basically trying to make the planet a better place, uh, we are your number one hub for that. So please do get in touch and write down my email so you can refer students to me. So um, today I'm gonna talk about viral things. And talking about viral, there is this one particular viral dance developed by one particular kid associated with one particular viral video game that everyone under 20 at least knows how to do. Um, and if you can imagine in your mind and think about what this uh, viral dance is all about, uh, feel free to add it in, your, in the chat section right in the left corner. Um, but what I'm talking about is this one. So it's the floss. Um, now the floss dance um, and this game Fortnite, I don't know how many of you might have pair, um, kids or uh, might be uh, might actually be playing Fortnite yourself. Uh, but the floss is a viral dance that has swept the world. Um, the game Fortnite even makes it more popular. Um, and it looks deceptively simple. But if you actually try to do it, and you don't have any coordination, it makes you look really silly. Um, but what's really interesting about this is that the viral quality of this particular dance in the game has um, launched off other side businesses. For example, there's this company that teaches kids uh, to stop staring at the screen and teaches them how to do Fortnite dance in, instead. Um, there's like Fortnite fitness programs. Um, parents all around the world wants to be cool, just like their kid. So they're also trying to do um, the floss dancing. And when I did that with my kids, they just told me that I'm a little bit cringy and I was embarrassing. So, but anyway, um, it's good to know. So the thing about the viral uh, quality of campaigns or dances or, um, or even uh, things like games, is that there's a really unique element to it. So I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, several viral campaigns uh, or viral um, initiatives. So this one, um, I call it, there's, I'm gonna talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and this one is the good. So there's, a, I, I don't know if you, any of you have heard about the Dove Real Beauty campaign. And the, the hashtag or the line is, you are more beautiful than you, you think. And so the Dove Real Beauty campaign was trying to get people to rethink the conventional idea of beauty. Um, and what's really interesting with this campaign specifically is they hire an FBI forensic artist um, and, and basically someone who draws photos of missing people or even criminals. And they asked the stranger to describe the person and then the forensic artist would draw the person based on the description of that stranger. And then the forensic artist would also draw the person based on the description of the person itself. And what's interesting is that when the forensic artist draws the de description, um, the uh, image of the person based on the person's own description, it usually is a little bit more harsher, meaning that we often judge ourselves more harshly than other people judge ourselves. So this was a really, um, it was a viral campaign. So as much as there are some good and funny or quirky viral campaigns, there are also some dangerous ones. So um, I'm thinking of this one. I don't know how many of you have heard of the Kiki challenge. Um, and if you have, you can put in the chat line. Yes, I have I've heard of the Kiki challenge. I've even attempted it. Well, uh, just be careful. Don't attempt it. It's quite dangerous. Um, so yes, I, I see comments saying, yes, I have. Um, so this is basically a challenge and please don't do it. Um, don't, I don't want to get sued. Uh, it's where someone basically jumps off from a moving car and then dances on the street while the car is still rolling. Um, to the song uh, by Drake, In My Feelings. It's so dangerous that people have ended up in the hospital from falling, being hit by another car, uh, being run over. But, uh, but again, you know, this is 
kind of the bad but viral um, challenge. So let's talk a little bit about, we have the good, we have the bad, I'm gonna talk about the ugly. So um, I don't know if I'm being fair, but, uh, but let's just talk about this particular viral um, product, right? Because there's sometimes it's campaign, sometimes it's product, sometimes it's a dance. This one is called the unicorn frappuccino. Well, the thing what's re really interesting about the unicorn frappuccino is that there's a unicorn craze all around the world. Uh, you see the unicorn backpack, the unicorn t-shirt, the unicorn colors, everything is unicorn. So even though this product has about 500 calories, uh, apparently people say that it tastes like a sour birthday cake. It has 16 grams of fat, 45 milligrams of cholesterol, 59 milligrams of sugar. Um, if you check Instagram and then you check the hashtag unicorn frappuccino, there's over 100,000 entries. Um, and so uh, what this um, particular phenomenon tells us is uh, this fear of like this FOMO, FOMO or F-O-M-O -O is the fear of missing out. Because this particular frappuccino is, um, is a limited edition, um, it doesn't get sold like all the other frappuccinos. So people went out in droves to buy this product, even though people said it doesn't really taste that good and it's loaded with lots of sugar and fat and cholesterol. So, but it still went viral. So in my research, in the work that I do, I want to learn more about these examples, you know, from the good, the bad, and ugly. Um, I want to learn more about like, how can we actually spread um, you know, uh, 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 and create awareness in a viral way, but for good, harness it for good. But also, how can we move from short term fleeting interest? So like, you know, a lot of the thing with the, with the viral elements is that it's very short term and fleeting. It doesn't necessarily create long term sustainable impact. So how can we actually harness the viral quality, but at the same time, maintain it to, to last um, long term, especially with sustainability initiatives? So the thing is, there's several tips that media experts would say would um, help influence people and um, create viral or unique initiatives that uh, get traction. The first one is spread the message using multiple channels. Obviously, I know several organizations, many food organizations that are trying to do uh, more multimedia using social media as well. So it's not just about sending that policy report or publishing the journal article. Even academics like me are being asked to write or uh, create short um, videos, so multiple channels is important. Another thing is to keep the message simple. So if you think about the hashtag, if you think about um, the, the Dove uh, Real Beauty campaign, there's a message, um, you are more beautiful than you think, and the message is simple. Another thing that's important is also creating a sense of urgency. So uh, Greta Thunberg, um, uh, Greta does this very well with the environmental movement, uh, with the climate change movement. So there's a sense of urgency. You know, our house is burning, uh, but in the frappuccino, uh, in the frappuccino example, the urgency is that this is a limited edition. You can only have this in two weeks, and then after that, it's gone. So creating a sense of urgency is key. Another tip from media expert is that it's important for the the either the messaging or the campaign to be positive or funny or emotional. So that's very important. And then doing something unique or unusual. So from the Kiki challenge, you can see that it's very unique or unusual for someone to get out of the car while the car is still rolling and dance uh, you know, with a Drake song. Uh, not saying that we need to do that, but it would be interesting to find something that's unusual or unique that can spread the message, but still in a good way. Um, another thing is to create a viral loop. So getting three people to do it. Um, and then who then gets three other people to do it. Um, a lot of this happens with, um, you know, for example, like challenges or petitions, like the ice bucket challenge. So um, when you tag someone and ask that person to do it, um, you know, it's possible to harness this uh, type of viral loop for the good, uh, but you use this tool of like making sure that others do it as well and getting other people to do it. And then the final one in terms of tips from media experts is attracting celebrities. So if you, any of you know like food celebrities out there that can help support your cause, that's definitely a bonus point there. So I wanna focus on food waste because again, that's my expertise and also it's Stop Food Waste Day. So let's talk about this wicked problem. And by the way, when I talk about wicked problem, um, it's not like, hey, it's wicked, like it's a good thing, but it's such a complex problem with Deep root is that it's deep rooted and need to be addressed from many different angles. Um, so I want to talk about the problem of food waste from the context and the scenario of the perfect storm. 
Uh, and if I'm talking about the perfect storm and you're thinking in your mind about the wonderful George Clooney, uh, I'm not talking about that one. Um, I'm talking about a more kind of bleak scenario. And if you, you were thinking about George Clooney, please feel free to put yes on the chat that you were thinking about him. But uh, no, this, was, this is a scenario that, that is kind of been projected by uh, a UK chief scientific advisor. So the scenario is called the perfect storm. Um, and it's a scenario where there will be increasing food scarcity around the world, uh, coupled by increasing water scarcity, um, and also energy instability, which will lead to more conflicts and riots and tension, which will lead to more mass migration and a refugee crisis, which according to Bennington will lead to a massive global war. And this scenario is absolutely frightening. Um, and in the beginning, I thought that this was just, you know, uh, kind of a science fiction story here. But in fact, again, I wanted to mention that this perfect storm scenario was put forward by Professor John Beddington, again, who is the chief scientific advisor of the UK government. And what he's saying is that, you know, listen, by 2030, we need to produce 50% more food. We will need 50% more energy and 30% more water to feed 9 billion people. And if we don't do that, the world will face this perfect storm of problems, just like the one that I mentioned. But as a food waste scholar, I, when I saw this, I just said, wait a minute, okay, let's pause here for a second. Um, it's interesting because we have this interesting contradiction. It's like a par paradox. So actually, to be honest, we currently grow enough food to feed 10 to 12 billion people already right now. And we have a population of about 7 billion. So we're not at, we're not at uh, even 9 billion yet. So in reality, we're actually overproducing. Um, in addition, between 30 to 50 percent of food is actually wasted globally per year to the tune of one trillion dollars. This is massive. One trillion dollars in Canada. The number is forty nine billion dollars wasted, while one in Canadian families are food insecure. So here there's a bit of a mismatch, right? There's overproduction and there's food waste and there's also uh, poverty and, um, and food insecurity. One thing that I also want to mention is that, you know, when we talk about the $49 billion number, is that waste in one country impacts other countries. So just an example, in UK, 1.4 million bananas get thrown out every single day. And one in three people throw out bananas if it has a bruise or a mark in the skin. So it doesn't matter what the content is, just even a little bruise or a mark on the skin means that one in three people throw it out. And one in 10 customers discard the fruit if there is any green on the skin. Now, I'm sure all of the 36 people listening who are very, very smart know that if there's green on the skin of the banana, it means that it's not fully ripe yet. So it should not be thrown out at all. But one thing that we have to remember is that the U UK does not produce bananas. Bananas come from elsewhere. So again, it's just a reminder that whatever we do here impacts other countries as well. So why is it so difficult to solve? Why is food waste such um, a complex thing to address? Uh, and why do we still have this problem right now? So I want to play a game with you. And um, so you probably can um, contribute in the chat section. I'm going to uh, talk about, I'm going to share this game called, is it food or is it waste? And I'm going to explain the definition first, OK? So um, if you've ever read or heard anything about food loss, OK, food loss is the term or waste that happens at the production stage, so at the farm level. So when food waste happens at the production stage, it's called food loss. And then when people say food waste, um, that's basically waste that actually happens at the consumption stage. So any, any, anywhere from retail all the way to the consumers, like to us. Um, and then there's another term called avoidable food waste. Avoidable food waste is food that was at one point edible, for example, you bought too much food, you bought a whole loaf of bread, and then you only ate half, so the bread went bad or moldy. So that's called avoidable food waste because it could have been avoided. And then there's another thing called potentially avoidable food waste. And this is usually cultural. Um, so it's food that's consumed by some people, but not necessarily by others. So um, an example would be offals, so, you know, like so the organs of animals, some cultures might, it might be common to eat that, and then other cultures, no. And then non-avoidable food waste are food waste or organic waste that under normal circumstances would not be edible. So if you ever eat an avocado, you know that the, the seed of it is really hard and it's generally not edible at all. So that's called non-avoidable. 
So food loss, food waste, avoidable food waste, potentially avoidable food waste, and non-avoidable food waste. So here, let's talk about this. Um, this is cauliflower um, at the farm that basically was wasted because it didn't meet um, aesthetic standards. So this would be called, and I'm gonna wait a second, and then one of you can plop in the answer, and then I'll just answer it. Food loss, perfect, getting one point. <laughs> Um, the next one, this one is basically hummus. That's perfectly good, but the thing is, it's three days before the best before date, or like several days before the best before date, and it was just chucked. Um, so if this was the case, um, what would this waste be? Is it avoidable, potentially avoidable, non-avoidable? I'm just gonna, avoidable, perfect. Oh, so smart, everyone's so smart. Okay, so how about this one? This is potato peel. So you have a potato, you peel off the skin. Is this avoidable or potentially avoidable or non-avoidable? Okay, potentially avoidable. I see someone saying that. Yeah, I guess it's potentially avoidable because some people do that and some people don't. But technically, when I do a waste audit, this would be in the avoidable category because it is edible, definitely. Um, and also, it's very, very nutritious. Now, how about this one? This is an eggshell. Um, eggshells are, is it avoidable, non-avoidable, potentially avoidable? I'm, I'm just waiting for a little bit of answers. I think most people don't eat eggshell. Non-avoidable. Okay. Yes, that is definitely the answer. It's not avoidable. Although I know some people that are super creative and then they do, um, crush the egg and, uh, and add it to their like flour to add some calcium. So that's definitely possible. Um, and then this last one. So to eat or not to eat. Um, fish head. Fish head is, uh, is it is it something to eat or not to eat? Okay, it's potentially avoidable. Yes. So um, some cultures um, eat it. They make it into delicious fish stew, fish soup. And then other cultures are maybe a little bit more scared of the fish staring back at them. But again, this just goes to show why it's so complex. Um, because definition, uh, the definition is not so clear cut. So how can we address this problem and how can we influence others to join? So let's talk about it. The one thing that is popular in the realm of food waste is this thing called awareness campaign. Awareness campaign is used by World Wildlife Fund, it's used by many NGOs, and the idea of this particular initiative is, oh, and I saw someone saying that fish head is yummy, yes it is, um, is that uh, basically if you have a campaign and you inform people, they can try to change their behavior. So for example, with this particular image, there's the basically Amazon, and it's showing that the Amazon is, or the forest, or the trees, or the lungs of the earth. And if you uh, uh, if you cut it or burn it down, then you're basically um, affecting your ability to breathe. You know, you're reducing oxygen. So it's a very powerful image. Another one, World Wildlife Fund. You know, well, with the tuna fish asking, would you care more if I was a panda? Again, this is uh, some interesting and creative ways to um, try to motivate people to change their behavior and their practice. Food waste is no different to, um, I mean, it's no stranger to awareness campaign. Um, historically, there's been many, many food waste campaigns, uh, especially during the war. Although I would say that the theme of these food waste campaigns were more about morality and ethics um, and patriotism. But this is it's different in contemporary food waste initiative. So here are some innovative and quirky food waste ads um, from the Love Food. Um, actually, this uh, there's Love Food Hate Waste Canada, uh, which is uh, very interesting. They do a lot of food waste initiative um, campaigns. But this one, the one in the bottom with all of the different pictures, is from Love Food Hate Waste UK, which is different than Canada, but is still within the same kind of broader umbrella. So the idea is that if you look like a particular food, whether or not you look like a chicken, a broccoli, a potato, or an apple, um, then you should not waste uh, these particular foods. So the, the food waste initiatives now are a little bit more funny and quirky. Uh, and I decided that I deserve um, my own ad. And so there I am. Um, of course, I like the spotlight. Um, and for me, I am a wrap lover because I love wraps. I love burritos. I love um, egg rolls, anything wrapped. And I kind of look like one too. Um, so I put their wrap lovers hate waste. So what's really interesting about the food waste initiatives nowadays is that it's not about moralizing. It just tries to kind of make things a little bit light and positive. Um, there's also the ugly fruit and vegetable campaign. That was a big one that went viral. Um, it actually started in France. Um, and then this ugly fruit and vegetable movement went all around the world, as you probably know about. Um, but the thing about food waste awareness campaign or even any informational campaign is that there's this thing called the value action gap. 
So the value action gap is this gap between people's awareness and what they say and what they know with people's action and what they actually do. And I think it's really important to understand this limitation in, in, in this value action gap because just because someone's educated or informed or knows about something, it doesn't mean that they actually have the ability to actually perform that action. If the structures, if the infrastructure is not there, if the system doesn't help them um, go towards better behavior or like still helps them to overconsume, uh, it's gonna be hard for them to translate their awareness and information into actual action. So what I do at SFU and with my research, especially as a land use planner, is that I try to look into how systems and structures can actually be coupled with the information and pedagogy and awareness and education so that it can be combined together to make sure that when you actually educate people on composting, there's actually a good running composting system for them to use, right? So it's about coupling the two together. And that's where you come, um, you bring the influencer side and then you add uh, the structural side to make sure that it's longer term and more lasting. So, I want to uh, put out a plea to all of you, um, to all of the different 36 guests. Please, we need you in this um, effort to stop uh, the massive amount of food being wasted. Um, and I want us to kind of think about the youth movement and the fact that they have been so successful because they have combined that sense of urgency, the humor, the human connection. Um, and, 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 and again, it's, it's <laughs> if you can look at the, the different posters, you know, keep earth clean, it's not, Beep, Uranus, <laughs> and there's also act local, um, but impact global, there's no planet B. You know, youth know how to influence and how to get things viral. Now we need to help with the supporting and the structural um, environment to make sure that this message is not just into, it's, it's actually translated into action. So I want to share with you some resources. Um, I've been part of a group that actually helped develop what is called the Food Matters Action Kit. Um, and you can find it on www.cec.org slash food matters action kit. And so what we what we did when we developed this kit is we work with youth stakeholders across North America. So we work with youth in Mexico, in the US and in Canada to develop this action kit to create a youth movement that will help us address food waste, not just change awareness and improve awareness, but actually move and do things and get things done. So I want to give you some examples. We have different worksheets. Uh, we have different activities, about over 60 activities, ranging from youth five years old all the way to university students at uh, 25 years old. We have badges, we have online profile. You actually will see the profile of my students there on the website. Um, and there's lots, uh, tons and tons of great activities and I hope you will uh, look through them. And you can download it for free and then just print them out and then uh, do it in class. What I really love also about this toolkit is that um, it is very much um, influenced and um, informed um, by the principles of equity and social justice, especially because we did work with indigenous youth across uh, North America as well. Uh, and so wh how, we, how we want to try to shape the paradigm around food is that we want to try to change people's view of food um, and move it from just seeing food as a commodity to actually seeing food as a relations, like seeing food as identity, as culture. So something that um, you would feel bad about throwing. So um, these are again, some activities and some examples of what we have. And this particular one is about um, uh, the, the Mexican Day of the Dead because we work with Mexican youth to actually develop uh, this particular activity. So one thing that I wanna leave all of you with is this beautiful, beautiful quote from, um, um, Martinez, who is the director of Earth Guardians, and I'm sorry I um, can't pronounce the first name. Um, we eat three meals a day, and every single one of those is an opportunity to make a choice for or against our future, for or against healthy a healthy climate. And he's an indigenous youth and um, the leader of the director of Earth Guardians. So we are all eaters, and we all have a role to play in this. So it's four, it's 3.59, four o'clock. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the time and opportunity to engage with you in the question right now, but what I want you uh, to have is my contact. So my contact is there, Tamara underscore Soma at sfu.ca, and I have two M's in my name. If you want to check what we're doing on the on our website, you can check foodsystemslab.ca. And if you want to join the youth movement and get 
youth in your schools or in your church community or it, at your YMCA or organization to get involved, um, please do check cnc.org Food Matters Action Kit. Um, and I'm th very, very thankful that you've um, come here to listen to the webinar and please do get in touch if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tamara. And thank you everyone for joining. I'm sorry we don't have time for, uh, to take any questions, but there's our email there. And if you have any feedback on how this webinar went and if you have other topics that you'd like to see uh, for future webinars, please do email me or get in touch with me. Thank you everyone for joining. Take care.